Hey, good morning, uh, Centerpoint friends, and happy Father's Day to all of you dads. We, uh, we had a huge celebration plan for you guys. Uh, today, we had $100 gift cards for everybody, for all the dads today, which is just a bummer that we weren't able to meet together. So the best we could do is just to wish you a virtual happy Father's Day. So maybe we can maybe we can replan that for uh, for next year. But but hey, seriously, uh, we appreciate you, dads. We do want to wish you a happy Father's Day, and we just want to thank you for loving and for serving and for leading your families the way that you do. And I want to just encourage you to keep Jesus uh, at the center of your family. It is a uh, it is a tough time. To be a dad, it's a tough time to be a parent in in the, the, this day and age. Uh, and I just want I want I want to encourage you uh, with this: your kids don't need you to have all of the answers to life's problems. What they need most from you is just your presence. They just need to know that you are walking through life uh, with them and all of this craziness. And so just be just be present. And you know what? Uh, your your kids are never too old. Uh, for to to need your presence, you, they will never outgrow uh, that, and so that's that's the biggest thing they need. That they do need one more thing. They they need some good dad jokes, and so uh, so I'm here to deliver some good dad jokes uh, for you guys for you guys to kind of pull out later today for your kids. So here here's one. Did you hear the rumor about the butter? Uh, you I, you can't answer. Let me start over. Did you hear the rumor about the butter? Well, I'm not going to spread it. <laughs> I know, it was pretty good, right? And pretty biblical, like no gossiping. Uh, how about this one? Uh, why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? It was too tired, right? Get it? Like two tires, too tired. I know. That was, that's bad. That's really bad. <clears throat> okay. Uh, wh wh what concert costs just 45 cents? It's a good one. Your kids should know this one. 50 cents. Featuring Nickelback, because it's like 50 cent minus, minus the it's common core math. I uh, know that's bad too. That's bad too. All right, how about, how about this? How about, a, um, how about a good golf story? Uh, some of you are going to play golf today. Uh, let's be honest, some of you are on the tee box right now, and that's okay. I don't blame you. This, this story could actually help your game today. In fact, this story could save your life. So a few years ago, I was playing golf with a friend of mine, and we were teeing off on, I believe it was hole number 16. So we were almost done uh, with the round. And uh, we walked up to the tee box, and the cart is parked about 15 yards away from the tee box. And I teed off. I had a decent, uh, a decent shot, and I walked back to my cart. Uh, this was the mistake I made. I walked back to my cart and uh, and got in and and it dawned on me, you know what? He could actually shank this and the ball could come right directly through my cart. I've played with him enough times to know that this trick shot was possible. Um, I've actually performed this trick shot myself, so I knew that it was it was feasible. And so I decided, you know what? I'm going to get out of the cart and stand behind it, stand behind it, kind of where the golf bags are, just for some protection. And so he's getting ready to tee off. And the other thing you need to know is that there was a there was a tree about 30 yards in front of the tee box, just off to the left. And he hit the ball, and the ball hit the tree, and it came off the tree at an incredibly high velocity. And I didn't see it until it got about right here, right now. I've got cat-like reflexes, okay, but no cat could survive that. And uh, I'm serious, that ball came over the top of the cart and hit me right here in the head, and I went down immediately. I thought, man, this is it. I started seeing visions of my kids and my wife kind of streaming through my, my head. You know, I thought this was like the big one. I'm coming home, uh, Jesus. And he walked over to me. He didn't say a word, and I'm thinking, I'm writhing in pain, and I'm thinking, what is he doing right now? Only thing I could think of was maybe trying to figure out what he was lying at that point, like, you know, one off the tree, two off my head. And I finally pulled myself together. I, I stood to my feet a little dazed. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been hit by a golf ball traveling at about 130 miles per hour, but it does sting just, uh, just a little. And the ball actually, this is no joke, the ball actually landed about 20 yards behind the tee box from where it hit my head. So it went a long way 
off the top of my head. And uh, you will be glad to know that I managed to par uh, that hole and still walk off the uh, the course uh, of that round with a victory as well as a massive knot right here uh, on my head. I can still kind of feel it a little bit several years later. But I just want to I just want to consider the irony for a minute. I'm actually in the golf cart, sitting in the golf cart thinking to myself, this is a dangerous spot to be. So I consciously stepped out of the golf cart to protect myself and then still got nailed by a golf ball. Um, I would have been I would have been better just staying in the cart, but instead, instead I decided to play defense. All right. I, I got out of the cart. I took cover. I sought protection and it backfired. And this is the reality of defense sometimes. Sometimes defense backfires. Sometimes defense isn't the best posture to play. Sometimes defense can actually make things a little worse. And I think this is kind of a picture of the church today. The church has this tendency to play defense. We have a tendency to kind of hide from the culture, to kind of protect ourselves from the, the culture. We don't like what's going on in the world, and so we, we react to it rather than respond to it. And as I said last week, Christians have a tendency to get mad and to get frustrated uh, for, for the world or over the world for acting like the world. We tend to get frustrated and mad at people who don't follow Jesus for not behaving uh, like Jesus. And, and so we react and we point fingers and we, and we judge. And, uh, and over the years, the church has gotten really good at pulling back, really good at socially distancing. We, we didn't want to be influenced by the world, so instead we withdrew from the world and we just kind of huddled together. And so last week we looked at, you know, the rhythm of the church, that the church, the early church was really about these three things. Uh, they worshiped together, uh, not only weekly, but daily, but they gathered together for worship. They gathered together in rich community. They served one another. They loved one another. They shared everything they had with each other. And then they, they, they lived surrendered lives. They went on mission together. They reached out and engaged the world around them. And these, these three things are what the church uh, is designed to be about. And this is how the early church grew so rapidly. Christians behaved like they actually believed in the God they were preaching. And they actually lived like they believed in the God they were preaching. And they sacrificed wealth and they gave up material possessions to give to people less fortunate, all because of this God that they were preaching. And in many cases, they, they gave their lives for this God they were preaching. And so many concluded that this God they were preaching must be real because they had never seen an ethic of love like this before. And love is what won the world over. They cared for orphans. They cared for widows. They cared for the sick. They cared for the disease. They cared for the lonely and the marginalized of society. The outward expression of, of the church, that piston, that surrendered living, piston was its unique mark for centuries the church was about doing good in the world and that was the driving force for nearly 2000 years and while the church certainly has its stains throughout history it was in its most organic form marked by love and engagement and acceptance and, and this inward posture this inward posture that we're all familiar with uh, 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 as it relates to the church um, it, it's really kind of a recent development. It's really happened within the last 70 years uh, or, or so. It began to take shape in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, there was a new genre of music that, that captured the culture, right? We call it rock and roll music. Drums and guitars became popular instruments, and the church didn't know what to do with this because rock and roll caused people to start to move a, a little bit. Pianos and organs were okay, but hips don't move, you know, to pipe organs, but, but drums and guitars were too secular. And so the church divorced itself from the culture and said, hey, that's fine out there, but we don't have any place for that in here. And as the culture progressed, the church lagged behind. The church grew insular. And in the 1960s, the, the divide grew larger. The Supreme Court made a significant ruling that prayer in public schools was no longer allowed. And the church grew more insular. 
And a few years later, the civil rights movement was well underway, led by Martin Luther King Jr., who stood on the truth of God's Word that all men were created equal, that there was neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, but all of us are one in Christ Jesus. And I heard his daughter speak at a conference a few years ago that I attended. And she said, my father believed that the church would stand with him, but the church was silent. And man, that struck me right in the heart. The church was silent. And the church was silent because it wasn't willing to engage in the cultural chaos. The civil rights movement was a political issue that should have been seen by the church as a spiritual issue, but the church didn't see it as a spiritual issue because it had turned inward completely. In the 1960s, introduced us to moral relativism. Morality is, is relative to the individual. You choose what's right for you, I'll choose what's right for me. And that launched a sexual revolution. Pornography made its way into our vernacular. Sex outside of marriage became a thing. And a few years later, 1973, abortion was made legal. And the church grew more and more insular. And the divide between the church and the culture grew larger, and the church became more and more culturally irrelevant. And so a lot of people like me didn't grow up in the church because my parents uh, were young adults in the 50s and 60s. They believed in Jesus, um, but had no desire to connect to the church because there was too much of a gap between the church and the culture. There was too much of a gap between the church and the world that they lived in, and they they didn't know how to bridge that gap, and so they just stayed away. There was a clear divergence between contemporary culture and the Christian worldview, and the church didn't know what to do other than just pull back and disengage. Now, now throughout the early history in America, evangelism and discipleship was really uh, the heartbeat of the church. The church was on mission. The church was on offense. But by the mid-1900s, the mission of the church Uh, changed from evangelism and discipleship to behavior modification and sin management. And so if you grew up in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s, you didn't talk about Jesus outside of church, even if you went to church. You didn't talk about Jesus outside the church around your friends because you didn't want other people to think that you were one of those people. Church wasn't a place that welcomed sinners. It was a place where Christians went so that they didn't become like sinners. The church moved from offense to defense, and the goal of Christianity was no longer about making disciples. It was about being good. And of course, the problem is that none of us are good. And Paul says in Romans 3 that no one is righteous, no one seeks God, no one does what is good. And so the church moved from offense to defense, and as a result, it's taken some major hits over the decades, and so it needs a reboot. Instead of letting people know what we're against, we want to let people know what we're for. We're for healthy families. Because when families are healthy, people in the family thrive, and the culture begins to shift. Uh, We're for sexual purity, because when we honor God's boundaries for sex, that it's between a, a man and a woman who are united together in the covenant of marriage, there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no sexually transmitted diseases, there are no unwanted pregnancies, there's intimacy between a husband and wife, which leads to healthy families, which leads to kids that thrive, which leads ultimately to a cultural shift. Uh, we're for racial equality. God didn't create uh, white people in His image. He created all people in His image. We bear the same thumbprint we bleed the same blood and we're saved by the same blood the ground is level at the foot of the cross and the blood of jesus flows uh, for over the sins of every man every woman every child regardless of race race or ethnicity and when there is unity people thrive and the culture shifts people don't thrive in division look around people aren't thriving right now So even if you don't believe in God, even if you don't believe in the Bible, you should want it to be true because it speaks to all these issues that we're facing. You want social justice? The Bible speaks to it. You want racial equality? 
The Bible speaks to it. You want an end to systemic poverty? The Bible speaks to it. You want to end the, the pandemic of fatherless children? Much worse than the pandemic of COVID. But you want to end that pandemic? The Bible speaks to it. More than 20 million children are living in a home without a father. And so just let that sink in for just a minute on this Father's Day. They'd love to give a gift to dad but they don't have that opportunity. And research shows that children from fatherless homes are much more likely to become poor, uh, to become involved in drug and alcohol abuse, to drop out of school, and to suffer from health and emotional problems. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. I God actually pre-thought this whole thing. And the reason it's not going so well is not because he's absent. It's because we've turned our back on him thinking we could just do better. And so regardless of how you feel about the church, God actually designed the church to confront these very issues. Right? Jesus was God incarnate. He was God in the flesh who walked among us to show us what God was like. He said, hey, if you've seen me, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what do we see him doing in the Gospels? Healing the sick, uh, embracing the broken, caring for the poor, eating with sinners, dining with derelicts, pastoring prostitutes. That's what we see him doing. And the church is called the body of Christ. The church is the incarnation of Jesus, commissioned by God to do the very same thing, to bring the kingdom of God to the junk of earth, to provide healing for spiritually sick people, to embrace the broken, to care for the poor, to love the unlovely. And the sad reality, the sad reality is that, th that the church has a reputation for being too good for the people Jesus was criticized for being too bad to be around. Let me say that again. The church has a reputation for being too good for the people Jesus was criticized for being too bad to be around. We've disengaged from the people that Jesus came to engage. And we've just got to own that. And we have to change that. We've got to reboot. I asked some of our staff members a few days ago what the church was, is, uh, is supposed to be for. I just, want to, I just want to list some of the things that they said. Uh, reconciliation. The church is for reconciliation. The church is for humble service. The, the, the church is, is for making strong families. The, the church is for uh, helping people have a sense of belonging. The church is for responding to the culture. The church is, is for promoting peace and unity. The church is for all people. Listen, the church has to be part of the solution for what's happening in our country because if it's not, it will ne never get fully resolved. These are spiritual issues at their core that can only be fixed with a spiritual solution. And so the church is, is an offensive organization by default designed to help people find and follow Jesus who changes their world and then through them, together with others like them, changes the whole world. And our greatest offensive weapon is prayer. And so in Acts 4, we see a picture of the church playing offense. Now, last week we looked at Acts chapter uh, 3. We saw Peter and John uh, heal a crippled beggar, and that miracle set the stage for them to preach uh, Jesus to a group of onlookers, which, guess what, landed them in jail. And so they spent the night in jail while these religious leaders spent the night trying to figure out what to do with them. They were nervous about this, this event and, and this Christian message uh, spreading. And so they were trying to contain it. They were playing defense. So let's read this. Acts 4, beginning of verse 17. It says, But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. They continued to threaten them. 
Peter and John were playing offense and they said, listen, we, we can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. We can't stop proclaiming the message of Jesus. It's the message of Jesus that has given us hope. It's the message of Jesus that has given us life. It's the message of Jesus that has redefined everything about us. And we want everybody to know that Jesus is for them too. And on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said uh, to them. They said, listen, here's the deal. Okay, we, we've, got, we've got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. We've been told to keep quiet and we've been instructed not to preach Jesus anymore. And check this out. When they heard this, when the people heard this, when they heard this, you fill in the blank. What would you do? If you heard this report from Peter and John, what would you do? When you heard this, you would, you would what? When we heard this, like we would, would we have a meeting together and, and, and just meet for hours on end and figure out what the game plan needs to be and what our strategy uh, needs to be because that's often what we're good at doing? Or, or when we heard this, would, would we just conclude that it's just too dangerous? That we just really need to keep quiet? The threats are, are, too, uh, are too dangerous uh, for us to continue. So maybe we just need to pack our bags and go home. But that's not what they did. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They raise their voices together in prayer uh, to God. Listen, when you're in trouble, when you're in a time of need, when you're at a crossroads, when, when, when things are uncertain, uh, is, is prayer your first thought or is it your last resort? And the first group of Christians, they prayed. And we want this to be our example. If offense is going to be our posture, then prayer has to be our practice. If offense is going to be our posture, then prayer has to be our practice. And, and offense for Jesus followers doesn't, doesn't mean running, it means kneeling. That we have no choice but to be on our knees before the God of heaven, asking Him to move mountains that we have no power to move ourselves. And make note of the word, together the early church was united. You see that all throughout the first several chapters of the book of Acts, they were one in heart and mind. That's a key theme. Nothing will hinder our prayers like division. So we've got to be united in this. And so here's what they prayed. Sovereign Lord, they said. You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything uh, in them. So they're praying just how Jesus taught them to pray. They're, they're first uh, starting with praise. They're acknowledging who God is. We talked about this a few series ago in our prayer series. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Start with who God is. And they said, listen, God is sovereign. He has a perfect plan. He rules completely. That's what sovereign means. He, he, he can, if he can make the heavens and the earth and everything uh, in them, uh, it means he has absolute power. And if he has absolute power, then he can absolutely deal with the powers that come against the church. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. This is Psalm 2 that they're quoting. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should Happen. Now, they're quoting Psalm, Psalm 2 there, which describes the revolt of the nations against God and His chosen Messiah. So when a new king was uh, enthroned, rulers were required to submit to his authority. But that was not always the case. Some of them resisted. Some of those rulers would refuse. And now they're laying this over top of uh, Herod and Pilate and the Romans and the religious leaders that they were all adversaries of Jesus. They're adversaries of this movement. They're not willing to submit to his authority. They're not willing to surrender their uh, position. And you know what? Uh, 2,000 years later, still true, isn't it? The church still has adversaries. 
There are people who still want to see the church close its doors. There are people who are still adamant about shutting down the message of Jesus. And that's because, that's because the enemy is still at work. And so we have two options, offense or defense. We, we, can, we can close ourselves off and just huddle together, or we can fall to our knees and pray together. The early church never considered closing themselves off. They, they never once contemplated defense. That was never an option. And look at what they prayed for. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I'm telling you, when I read that prayer, I'm so convicted because I don't pray like that. I, I don't pray that God would enable me. I pray that God would protect me. That, that's defense. I don't, I don't pray that God would stretch out his hand and perform miracles. I pray that he would stretch out his hand and, and cover me. That's defense. And maybe the reason that we don't see the same results that the early church saw is because we don't pray the same prayers that they prayed. They relied on a sovereign God, and I think the church today relies on a safe God. And a safe God is a false God. It's an Americanized version of a God that we believe wants us happy and wealthy and comfortable and safe, and so that's how we play it. We pray for God to remove obstacles. They prayed for God to help them, to enable them to overcome them. We pray for protection against threats. They prayed for boldness to speak truth in the middle of those threats. We pray for an easy path forward. They prayed for miracles along the path. Philip Brooks wrote this. He said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Jesus said, hey, if you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself and you got to take up your cross. And here's the thing. The cross of Jesus is heavy. And so we can pray for lighter crosses or we can pray for stronger backs. One is defense. One is offense. One will coddle us and one will change us. And look at what happened after they prayed. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. See, the Holy Spirit is the power source of the church. We talked about that week one, that we can't move without the power of the Holy Spirit. But prayer is our conduit to tap into that power. Prayer is the thin nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. If we want something new, and we need a new posture. If we want justice, let's pray. If we want healing, let's pray. If we want unity, let's pray. If we want racial equality, let's pray. If we want revival, let's pray. God, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your son, Jesus. Friends, I want to be a church that doesn't just pray, but a church that prays boldly, a church that prays expectantly, a church that prays passionately for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I read a book by uh, Jim Cimbala several years ago called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And it's an excellent read on the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of prayer. I just want to read you a quote from his book. It says, The work of God can only be carried out by the power of God. The church is a spiritual organism fighting spiritual battles. Only spiritual power can make it function as God ordained. The key is not money, organization, cleverness, or education. 
And this is a convicting question. Are you and I seeing the same results that Peter saw? Are we bringing thousands of men and women to Christ the way he did? If not, we need to get back to his power source. No matter the society or culture, the city or town, God has never lacked the power to work through available people to glorify his name. And when we sincerely turn to God, we will find that the church always moves forward, not backward. Our stance must remain militant, aggressive, and bold. In other words, we need to be playing offense, not defense, by making bold requests to God, believing that He will meet us with a fresh portion of His Holy Spirit and empower us for the mission that He has set before us to help people find and follow Jesus, to make disciples who make disciples. Let's be about that. And may our posture always be one where we are on our knees before our Father. Let's do that right now. Father, we humble ourselves before you. And we repent for the times that we've gotten it wrong. We repent for the times that we've relied on our own strength. We've repent for the times that we've cowered back. We repent for the times that we've disengaged. And we ask that you would readjust our posture to one of offense. We, 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 we ask God that you would give us the discipline for this daily practice of prayer to become the men and women you've called us to become, to be filled with courage, to embolden us to speak your word with great power and great authority. That God, everything that's happening in our country right now, it finds its root um, in brokenness. And it's a spiritual issue. And you've designed the church to speak into spiritual issues with hope and healing. So God, we would ask that you would give us the courage and the wisdom to do just that, that you would find us a faithful church on our knees in prayer and boldly proclaiming the message of Jesus as the hope of the world. We pray that in the strong name of Jesus.